So, uh, yeah, today we gathered here to answer the most fundamental problem in the existence. So why the announcement says there are two folks presenting and there is only one. So, um, well, yeah, that's an unfortunate event, unfortunately. So uh, my colleague was not able to attend due to airline just rescheduling his flight to like literally now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sorry for that. Yeah, we'll we, we can still cover the whole thing. But uh, yeah, just to talk about who am I to begin with. So I am a solution, principal solutions architect. I've been working with AWS for, uh, yeah, for five and a half years up to date. Um, yeah, so I'm speaking about this topic because I work all the time with a lots of different customers. So yeah, it says gaming. No, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> well, announcement does. So yeah, technically I work with the gaming customers a lot. I work with ride hailing customers, e-commerce, uh, banking, whatever. Before AWS, I also been building a lots and lots and lots of different systems, including digital signatures and whatnot. So I do work a lot with the customers and I hear a lot of their stories and how do they use the technology that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, just to set the baseline, what are we talking about today? This is this this will not be the machine learning educational session. So I will not explain all the details how machine learning works to begin with because there is a lot of materials on that. And that's not the goal of today's talk. The goal of today's talk is actually to talk about the use cases that we see in the industry uh, and not only in gaming, by the way, just across multiple different industries and how, like which basic pieces comprise these use cases and uh, yeah, how do these pieces interact with each other. So there will be some machine learning theo uh, theo theory here, but it will not be like super deep. I just want to set up the baseline because not everyone here knows what machine learning is. Well, <laughs> I hope it's not that bad, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, we need to set up some, some baseline here and uh, then we go deeper into the use cases and what kind of t uh, tech is there. I will also present a couple of very, very recent uh, architectural um, guidances that we developed at AWS, which actually explain the whole thing pretty much accurately. So basically, very, 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 very uh, briefly about the basic things. So what's AI? Basically, it's the way to describe any system that can replicate tasks that previously required human intelligence. So it's a layered system, so we have like Machine learning, which is a subset of it, uh, and almost AI, al almost all AI systems nowadays, they are created using the machine learning. So obviously, subset of this whole thing is the deep learning techniques. So it's a type of machine learning that uses a technique known as a deep, uh, deep neural networks. Uh, these systems replicate how the human brain works. Uh, well works, functions, whatever, which allows those systems to address more complex uh, use cases that were pre previously impossible. Obviously, we're going deeper with uh, reinforcement learning, we're going deeper into generative AI that everybody heard about, and yeah, we'll, we'll hear a lot about this today as well. So, um, for supervised and unsupervised uh, learning, you basically supply the data for training. So depending on quality and volume of the data, it makes the prediction. So pre pretty simple. So supervised learning algorithms, they train on a sample labeled data. Basically the, the data that describes both the algorithm item input and output, you have to label it, you have to feed it to the model, and then you have the, some, uh, some output. In, con in, contrast, in contrast, unsupervised learning acts on unlabeled data. So this came through the new data and established new meaningful connections basically. Uh, between unknown input and uh, and predetermined outputs, and it it just provides an output. Uh, there is also like combination of the whole thing. It's called semi supervised uh, learning. It's basically when you combine both models. And reinforcement uh, learning, it's it acts without any training data required. So it, it rather generates training data based on interacting with environment via agents, and good input is rewarded for reinforcement. Uh, of the behaviors. Very, uh, very AWS centric example here is we have this, um, this, this small card. Uh, 
I, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> okay. Well, this small small machine basically you, you build the track on it, and this machine is run on the track, and you you provide the model the mechanics to reinforce its learning. So it's like when it gets gets out of track, it gets it gets minus points, and and vice versa. Uh, so obviously you need data. Without data, no machine learning. It doesn't work <laughs> without it. Uh, so every company have their own unique set of data. And um, basically, there are two different ways in building AI-based solutions um, driven uh, with unique data. So either you train or retrain model based on the data that you use, or, or you use fine-tuning fine in correlation with foundational models. So obviously, data lake is where your data resides. So we're talking about uh, object storage. We're talking about uh, data warehouses. We're talking about uh, transactional databases, like all kinds of uh, all kinds of data is here. Simulation environment is basically when you run A/B testing, when you run test predictions, you evaluate model performance. Maybe you want to try, I don't know, arm, uh, like bandit mechanics. Okay, that's that's a good uh, good uh, good start here. And we're gonna deep a bit di uh, dive a bit deeper here. So uh, machine learning br it brings a lots of benefits when solving complex problems. Um, uh, but it's not this, the easiest <laughs> mechanics out there, to be honest. So, because, well, well, why? Because you need to collect, clean, format, uh, training data, and actually it's an iterative process. So you need to operate on your, on your data like over and over when you get a no, no new data. So once the data set is created, uh, you need to make sure that the algorithms are also scale quickly in production. So even simply figuring out how to train the complex models uh, or on increasingly larger data sets can often be like a blocker because you need skill sets, you need teams, you need some, some, some people who understand the whole thing. So once you need to, you're ready to go, once you're ready to move to production, yes, you need to host the model and this model has to be scalable and it has to be scalable to, a, I don't know, multiple users if, for example, it's a recommendation model. Okay, it will have like a huge, huge load if you have a big pro big product, obviously. Uh, and you also need to handle things like handovers of the models between teams, or maybe you have uh, like a feature store that you need to share between different teams. So like a lot, lots of things here. So uh, there are mechanisms that help to avoid this thing. I actually am uh, coming from the developer side and in this case i am a bit lazy actually <laughs> i like i love these mechanisms so for example uh things that we think that we have is a uh, sage maker and it basically helps you to fully streamline the whole pipeline of data preparation and data analysis acting on the data uh, building the model retrain the model host the model and the whole thing so without uh, these mechanisms it will be like well, a bit harder. Obviously, you can run, the, you can spin the whole thing in Kubernetes, for example. But yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, from our side, yeah, SageMaker actually is the technology that helps a lot. However, machine learning is not always the solution. Just <laughs> that's important because uh, everybody's like trying. Okay, machine learning. It's a very nice, interesting gimmick. Let's. Let's dive into it. Not really. So, for example, you have um, cases when okay, you don't have skills. You you know the machine learning knowledge. Uh, you know the machine learning word, and I don't know someone from C level heard uh, like very nice word inference, and they want to try it, but you don't have a skill set. But you have people who can do it by 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 statistical methods. That's totally fine. You don't need the machine learning here. So, additionally, you need a deterministic explainability. So you need a concrete output every time you feed the data in. With machine learning, it's not always uh, that straightforward. Obviously, if you cannot label the data for training, or it's expensive, or uh, I don't know, something like this, it's another, another issue when you do not need to have machine learning. And obviously, if you cannot formulate the problem in machine learning terms, yeah. So let's talk about the use cases of uh, how we call it classical machine learning. Technically, uh, speaking about game tech uh, to begin with, 
there is always uh, a lots of use cases like this abstract use, uh, very very specific use cases like for example building bots for the games uh, image recognition uh, foul language identification for example you have a lot of chats and uh, people are writing some terrible stuff in it and you need to identify it and block these people and whatnot uh, it's a very common thing but frankly the most common use case in game tech and uh, lots of other industries related to that it's uh, LTV personalization and churn why it's very simple because it helps you to identify and increase lifetime value of the customer it's well, <laughs> it's money <laughs> come on <laughs> it's very simple here so this, this kind of predictive data it helps companies to identify uh, to create target audiences identify VIP players uh, it it helps to identify those at uh, who uh, at the risk of leaving at the cur currently, so companies can adjust their resources like marketing resources or whatnot based on this data. So much for using machine learning, basically uh, classical machine learning models, players are profiled according to their activity, gaming behaviors, uh, and dedicated content is ba is basically being selected and shown to them to prevent churn basically churn is when people are leaving and never coming back to your to your product ever again uh, so use cases very very specifically speaking so for example players that are at risk of leaving they are tagged for investigation so either internally or externally it doesn't matter or things like predicting ltv or three uh, three five seven days or whatever so if retention has changed uh, a player cohorts uh, well, if retention has changed for a player cohort, then it's uh, it's notified smart marketing and whatnot. Uh, but what's interesting here is that okay, these use cases have been there for a lot. It's like we we heard about that. What's changed nowadays is the amount of data that you have to process, and that's that's the interesting part because uh, like sheer amount of data because it comes from event streaming, it can it comes from click stream, it comes from games, it comes from partners, payments all kinds of places and you need to aggregate this data you need to classify it you need to group it and you need to act upon it so quickly going back to the whole pipeline again uh, what i'm going to show is basically it's the same pipeline so you you ingest the data you process the data you train the model and you use the model for inference and this this thing basically it's the um, it's the solution that has been built recently like really recently by our proserve team and what's interesting about the whole thing, it has very, um, very, very high load. Cap it is very high load capable, basically. So it can process. It has 50,000 uh, messages, but actually it goes over 60,000 messages per second, and um, with average message size of seven megabytes per second. And that's only due our, uh, during our tests using uh, well, we used uh, M5 ATX large uh, instances. If it if it does tell you anything, <laughs> because it's AWS terms. Uh, yeah, so like average average kind of instances, and this this system actually processes this high amount. So what's are the what are the key pieces here? Uh, I won't be able to. Sh uh, I can. Okay. Nice. Yes. So. Yeah, so the first piece is basically Kafka. <laughs> Manage Kafka from our side, but technically it's just a, it's a Kafka broker. And yeah, it's it's a three broker setup. Uh, it's nothing special, but it's 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 super vital for the whole thing and it processes so many so many so much data. Next piece is MSK Connect. This piece, what it does, it just sends the data to the object storage, S3 in our case. Why is it needed? Uh, well, this data is being then uh, either used by the machine learning teams to fit to the to the model, or it is used by analytics in the same machine learning teams uh, by querying it directly, like using S uh, ad hoc SQL queries. Another interesting piece here is uh, where is my mouse? Yeah, it's on here. Uh, so it's uh, Flink Apache Flink. So basically, in our case, it's a managed managed service for Apache Flink. And what it does, it implements the business logic. So that's basically the core of the system. And what it does, it does message par parsing. So it converts messages from proprietary uh, data formats uh, to something understandable like JSON. It does message validation. So for example, your cast, uh, your players or whatever, they have some IDs, bank IDs, whatever. And you need to validate it with, an, with external system that says, well, okay, this, this, this player is who he, who he says he is. And uh, message enrichment, obviously, so it reads multiple messages from Kafka. 
it applies windowing to understand uh, player re preferences and calls an external service, basically uh, for recommendation or whatever uh, next next games should be played. So basically, it does a uh, call to recommendation system. SageMaker, this piece, yeah, I don't see my mouse anymore. Here it is. Uh, so it hosts the models. Basically, that's that's where the API to call the model is. So uh, Flink basically calls the endpoints of the SageMaker and gets inference and acts upon it. So yeah, DynamoDB is a small thing just just for, to store the. Uh, the, the the configuration here, S3 obviously that's the centerpiece. That's where the data is. Uh, in our case, this is glue, but it can be just Spark, whatever. You just you can just put put Spark here. What it does is basically just uh, uh, does the data transformation, um, aggregation, and whatnot. And things like Athena is just to run the ad hoc queries. So if you if you know the know the word Presto, that's basically it. Uh, yeah, security monitoring. Obviously, that's a very that's very very interesting topic, but we will we will not dive into it a lot. I, I will mention it a bit later. Uh, yeah, dashboarding using Grafana, which is totally fine. Uh, okay, now going to the generative AI part. So with machine learning, it's it's that straightforward. Just just again, ingest, data processing, inference, rinse and repeat. That's it. Gen AI. So we spoke about classical machine learning models and how do they work, but how do they compare with the latest hype, which is Gen AI? So basically, um, uh, the size and the, uh, and the general purpose nature of foundational models it makes them different from traditional machine learning models, uh, which typically uh, machine learning classical machine learning models they typically perform one single task. They are they are built for it. They are trained for it. Uh, foundational models uh, they instead of gathering label data and training multiple models, uh, they just use the same pre-trained foundation model to solve multiple tasks. It just trained on a huge corpus of data, and it makes predictions. But frankly, in many cases, it's not as good as the dedicated machine learning model because if you have a dedicated use case. And you can formulate it in a classical machine learning terms. It might be the best option. However, there are different use cases, and there are even use cases when both are used interchangeably. I will speak about it later. Uh, it's it's a very interesting use case, by the way. So when it comes to foundational models, there are we can generally split them into three pieces, three three types, three categories: text to text, obviously. When you feed the text, you get the text as an output. Very simple. Uh, text to embeddings. That's an interesting part because it's it is used by the underlying technology that uh, underlying technique that we will talk about later. So basically, what it does, it takes the text and it converts it to numbers, just vectors, basically. Uh, why is it needed? It's needed for a thing called RAG, response augmented generation. Why is it needed? I will talk about a bit, just just on the second slide. <laughs> no, one slide ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, and the multimodal uh, models basically when you feed the text and you get an image or sound or whatever in return. So you must most likely experiment it with those already. So diffusion, uh, stable diffusion, DALI, Midjourney, yeah, we all know this. So how do we actually use the whole thing in code? So most of the GNI models currently they expose APIs. It's it's very simple. It's sometimes it's stressed API, maybe sometimes it's something different. Uh, but uh, it's much more convenient to work with these APIs in a structured manner. So, for example, when you work with the GNAI model, you need to maintain a thing called memory. Memory is basically the the how how do how does model remember the conversation, and to handle the whole pipeline. Well, of course, you can write the whole code. You call the API, store it somewhere in uh, I don't know some database, whatever. But uh, the, these these two technologies basically they help you to use the framework to work with the GNAI models in a streamlined fashion. So Langchain, it's um, basically uh, it's an open source framework that helps you to create a pretty straightforward, uh, however complex and interactive uh, language language models based applications. It can be used for multiple um, multiple use cases like. Whatever text summarization, input image generation, and so on, but it's uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. It has connectors to most uh, most modern models. 
It supports features like storing your memory, retrieving your memory, uh, context feed, generating the prompts, like engineering the prompts. So it's, it's a very, very nice tool. Another one is Llama Index. Uh, it's ideal for working with cases uh, where you need to build a solution that is heavily data centric. Um, like complex search systems, for example, or data retrieval. So it is ideal for content generation, document search, uh, chatbots, etc. Uh, also, very important to note, Llama Index is a commercial product. So it it costs uh, certain amount of money. I'm not sure which which amount it is, but it does. But don't just throw it away because it costs money, just try to use it for your use case and see if it fits, if it, if it does, especially if you have to handle a lot, a lot, a lot of data, that, that might be actually a very, very good option. So the technology that I mentioned, RAG, so what it basically is, RAG stands for uh, Response Augmented Generation. And uh, why is it needed to begin with? So we all know Gen AI models hallucinate. <laughs> they create, <laughs> I don't want to say this word, but yeah, they, they create ab absurd stuff. And um, also Gen AI models, uh, in general, they are not restricted in any way. So in order to battle this issue of uh, hallucinations and how to restrict the data, basically the REC was uh, invented. So it basically, it, it helps you to feed most up-to-date information and helps you to customize the model response based on defined data set uh, that you basically provide. Uh, to make it a bit more, more concrete, so for example, every time new data arrives, you load it into object storage, S3 bucket, and run an automated ingestion job to update the backing data store, and you're basically done. So no need for, for retraining your model or update uh, any parts of the actual implementation itself. So uh, it saves you, uh, saves you a lot of time. And it's also supported by multiple uh, LLM models. So basically, it's very easy to, to subtract uh, different models. So actually, Claude 3 is on the slide. OK, we, we had 3.5 re released yesterday, yesterday actually. <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, let's go a bit uh, to, to see how the architecture for the whole thing works. So basically. On your left, you have the process that occurs when the end user interacts with the application and is waiting uh, for a response. Uh, on the right side is what's happening underneath. That's basically where the large, large language model interacts with vector store, uh, ingestion pipeline is, uh, and where the data sources live. And also, and also the whole thing has to be governed. So Technically, governance is a very, very big topic. I will spend a bit of time explaining it. So we have two emerging areas to focus on in governing the models. So data, data that is used for large language models is usually stored in data silos. Data silos like huge data stores and in, in different lots of formats. And generally, it's not managed or governed the same way as structured data does. Like, for example, in SQL and in, in object storage, it's two different things. So unstructured data has to be uh, it has to be discovered and attributed using the metadata catalogs. It has to be classified and masked. So for example, you have PII data, like okay, you you show in uh, like click stream from your games and there are names or phone numbers of your customers. This has to be uh, this has to be cleaned out and, and masked. Uh, obviously, it this data has to be linked to the structured data, and data with within vector store, it has to be covered covered by RBAC and F FGAC. Basically, FGAC is fine grade access controls. And obviously, if you request the data, the the request prompts also have to be engineered and governed and whatnot. So let's take a look on how does it work from the end user perspective. So the flow looks something like this. And a user asks a question. The uh, generative AI application gets the conversation history and determines the situational context. Address, name, type, uh, car, family members, whatever. Then it tokenizes the prompt and creates the question embedding. Uh, then it retrieves data similar to target question from uh, using similarity search from the vector store. It invokes LLM with the whole with, with this data and summarizes the output well back to the customer. Additionally, what's emerging right now is agents. Agents basically is the way to act on uh, 
well on, on the search basically so you, so you, you you make a question so for example we are uh, well, some company we need to send an emails or you know, which is more relevant i think is the debugging information so you have logs in your open search you have metrics in uh, i don't know prometheus whatever so one of the ways would be actually to uh, to request these stores but you, you want to formulate your question in a natural natural way so basically agents is the method to call or make external calls or make external actions based on the um, well on a request basically how it works how it it it, it works very simple so uh, llm actually understands what you're writing uh, it has link to the um, to the executable code in aws it's lambda functions we use lambda functions for every glue <laughs> there is uh, so yeah, and basically LLM understands what you're asking. It, it takes the input, it feeds it to the lambda function. Lambda function does whatever. Uh, pretty simple, but it's a very powerful technique, and well, it will it will grow, frankly. So talking about use cases. So we classify customer use cases into well, Gen AI use cases, obviously. We classify them into three types so first of all helping game cast game developers uh, to build the content to include in the game etc 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 second is in-game features so we are talking about you know, how players interact with the game uh, how to sc how to scale the game how personalize the game etc etc and the last one is the publishing operation it's basically things like customer service chatbots marketing community management well things these things that are boring but you know it pays your bill so uh, speaking about accelerating game development, so there are lots of interesting use cases here. Um, it, just, just use it as a, as a food for thought. Uh, so first of all, obviously, game needs to be developed. And to develop the game, you need a lot of content. Uh, content like images, characters, textures, sounds, whatever. So what, what do game developers sometimes do? They just create um, skeleton projects with the placeholder, placeholders placeholders for characters, for textures, for something. So Gen AI can actually fill in these placeholders, not for production, but to convey your idea to, to your other teams, for example, maybe to customer, whatever. Uh, also, super logical use case is game localization. Just raise the hand who speaks Chinese. No? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is one person. Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. So basically, uh, if you want to translate the game lore to game instructions, uh, maybe text, whatever, to the target audience, and you don't have resources to, to do it or outsource it to the external, uh, to the external company, game localization use case using the LLM is the most logical thing here. Obviously, we're talking about synthetic voiceovers, like, for example, yeah, just, just, just synthetic voiceovers. There's no example here. So improve collaboration. For example, you, you are interacting with a musician who writes the music to you. So musician sends you the sample of the music. You listen to it, okay, says, okay, and, and you think like, okay, I, I need to change this, 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 and this thing. I pre-generate some samples using GNAI. Obviously, it will not go to production because it's it's lame. So you send it back. So this way you convey the idea to the musician. Or oh, same with artists or whatnot. Additional important use case, knowledge basis. Uh, almost everyone I speak with, they implement knowledge bases <laughs> right now because, uh, well, well, we'll talk about it later uh, a bit. Obviously, we talk about narrative generation, story generation, lore generation, and very interesting use case. I mentioned it a bit before. So when you need, uh, well, you have a machine learning model that generates images. But to train this model, you need images which are well, image basically with description of what's happening on this image. So, for example, cat with the ball, whatever, 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 label data, basically. So, in order to generate this data, you can use a huge amount of people, actually, who look at the pictures and write the whole thing. Or you can use an LLM that looks at the pictures, says, okay, this is a cat with the ball. Then you feed this data to the machine learning model, and then you generate your images based on your, on your content. That's a production use case right now already. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but what's important here is that these tools are not made to replace developers. I'm, I'm actually a huge advocate of the whole thing because 
LLM will not, uh, I, I don't think it's the tool to take your job. It's the tool to actually help you get better at your job. Frankly, it's a, it's, it's, it's a hammer. Like consider it a hammer, like a very advanced hammer, obviously who can talk to you, but you know, uh, so yeah, just consider it a very, very advanced tool that you have to learn already at some point, but uh, don't, don't fret. It's not, it's not made as something that substitutes you. Okay, talking about the game experiences. So obviously we are talking about things like dynamically adjust gameplay experience or generating realistic uh, interactions with NPCs. Some of you have heard about it already. And what's interesting here, um, re remember we were talking about RAG, race sponsor meta generation. So basically you can feed your lore and data in, uh, to the model and generate the text and outputs based on, uh, on your game data or whatever product data that you have. So it's like, it doesn't need to be game, it can be like, be like, I don't know, chatbot and chatbot can act within the data that you feed to it. So yeah, obviously we're talking about virtual assistants, chatbots, etc. cetera here. Uh, interesting use case that I've seen already and it's been already implemented. It's a uh, real-time esports storytelling. So there is, for example, some Sporting event happens, I don't know, soccer, whatever. I, I think it's Euro right now happening in Munich where I need to return in three hours. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and basically the feed of data is being fed to your model and you generate narratives, you generate dashboards, you generate scores and whatnot. So, and it can already be done uh, stream-wise. Uh, obviously, yeah, user-generated content to attract uh, streamers or whatnot. So a lot, a lot of things like this. Uh, and last one, the one that usually is boring for the development audience, but it's actually super important for the business audience, frankly. So I, I decided that it's important to include here as well. So we are talking about automatization of marketing here. So yeah, you need, uh, well, you, yeah. B before it was very easy to just generate like, uh, uh, g just g get the mail, replace the placeholder with the email of the customer, send this email, and that was the personalization. Nowadays, it's a bit more complicated than that because you need to t you need to generate images, you need to generate uh, marketing materials, whatnot, 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 and personalize to each customer, each specific customer. So it can be done. Very optimized marketing teams they can do it pretty quickly, like one marketing campaign in in a day. <laughs> yes. But uh, with Gen AI, you can actually g generate hundreds and thousands of those. And that's, that's, the, that's the big thing. And the whole thing actually can be automated. So you can automate the feedback loop from the customer, uh, feed it back to the LLM model, summarize the whole thing, what people think, and just feed it back. So we also talk about um, yeah, chatbots again. Same here, it can, be, it can be done here. And for example, what Electronic Arts does, uh, so they have this worldwide customer experience uh, team, not, not team, but even technology. It uses Gen AI to solve various customer uh, service use cases, uh, and these include automated Q&A, engagement summarization, uh, ticket assist, and whatnot, whatnot, whatnot. Important point here is that when you generate the content for marketing, for websites, and whatnot, if it's Gen AI automated, it can be a deranked by Google <laughs> because they identify that the content is uh, Gen AI generated. And second thing, uh, well, it can hallucinate. So if you generate uh, something silly, well, just test it, I guess, using the different Gen AI model or any other technique, just read through it at least. Uh, so talking about architecture, this, this is the guidance that has been published, I think like a week ago, actually, and it depicts, basically what it does, it's an automated NPC generator using the Gen AI services, and it depicts three flows. First one is the basic Gen AI flow. So as I said, Gen AI models usually are hosted somewhere and they expose API. So basically what you do, you just use an API gateway, whatever there is, and you just call the model directly. Second flow is fine-tuned LLM. So basically you use your data to update your LLM. Uh, that's, that's a topic interesting because usually LLM, they are trained on huge corpus of data and well, I don't have money for that. I don't know if you do, but that's a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And uh, in order to fine tune your model, there are different techniques already, but you do not need 
to to feed the whole Google to your LLM in order to change it a little bit. So you can you can just feed your own documents. And the thing and the third third flow is basically the rack that I explained already. So uh, I'll just get I'll just get to it. And obviously the whole thing has to be automated. Come on, <laughs> you don't just click the whole thing. Uh, so we break the architecture into four sections. Basically, the API that is used to invoke the models, the call pipeline that is built to maintain the whole thing, uh, continuous fine tuning, which is interesting here, is that uh, well, basically how it works, there is a chain of steps to fine tune your model, and you use the state machine to run these steps. So uh, in our case, you can see there is a message bus here, SQS. Basically, it receives the message from the uh, from the bedrock service, which, which says, okay, I need to train the data or whatever. Then it runs the state machine. In our case, it's a step functions, but it can be airflow or whatever you like. Uh, it runs the, the whole thing, trains the model, updates the model, and spits it back to the, to the bedrock itself, so it can be, can be used. And the third one is RAG. Super simple, actually. It's basically, what it does, it automatically hydrates the, the, the vector database. It's an, basically, it's an alternative way to fine tuning. So we convert the data to vector space. We hydrate the vector database. Uh, and this data is used to add context to the model. Hydrating basically means you just take the document, you break it into chunks, you create embeddings of these chunks. Embeddings basically is just a numeric representation of the chunk. And you feed it to the, to the, to the database. So as you can see, it's, it's really not a magic. It's just an API which is connected by API, by the API and the API, and uh, there's a bit of rest. So, yeah, I'm talking about more use cases, intelligent asset engines, that's, that's a very interesting one because now we're talking about chatbots and contact centers, but what uh, I actually heard a very interesting story about how it is implemented. So one of the large customers that I've talked with, they actually did what they analyzed their uh, their customer base, and they found out that the customer base is predominantly Gen Z, and Gen Z do not like to call. So they realized, okay, so let's si since they don't like to call, but they like uh, texting or whatever, uh, WhatsApp, whatever. Let's just implement the chatbot. Uh, it took them a week to implement the first iteration of the chatbot, and uh, it handles, yeah, like actually th thousands of requests per month even more than that, and it's maintained by a single person right now. <laughs> so that's, that, that's how it's simple, actually, to just inter integrate all these APIs and whatnot all together, and you don't need to be uh, like a super scientist to that. I love it personally because I am a lazy developer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it. <laughs> so support lines and knowledge mines, oh yeah. Um, that's what I hear a lot because uh, lots of you have Confluence, lots of you have wikis, uh, quip documents. I don't know, maybe you have like uh, some file server where you just dump text documents uh, where people just write things. Look, it's like, okay, that's our code style. And uh, when you collect uh, folks on, on a meeting, uh, there are like 100 folks and only one single person knows where the data is which is yeah which is common so that's that's the use case basically when you create the um, the, the chatbot that taps into this data to this confluence to this whatever 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 and that's exactly where the rec uh, rec uh, architecture fits in so basically you connect to i don't know confluence whatever you download the data you put it onto s3 or, or some object storage or or you just directly in, uh, flush it into the open source or I don't know, ClickHouse, whatever. And yeah, basically that, that's how you uh, that's how you do it. Uh, you do the whole thing. It's actually what Audi does. They presented the whole thing, I think, like a couple of weeks ago on Berlin Summit. So basically, what what they do, they have well, it's a large company. They have a lots of um, lots of internal teams. So what they did, they built the mechanism to create the chatbots based on what kind of person asks them to do to do so so basically uh, some someone from development teams comes to them and, say, and says okay i need i need the chatbots for the for the for the technical documentation and they have the whole thing as far as i understood automated uh, at least half of them semi automated and yeah they basically generate the chatbot they set up the permissions within their data and they limit the chatbot to this exact deck uh, 
chunk of data, and they just provide the interface back to the developer. Great. <laughs> There's <laughs> nothing else to say here, actually. Um, so yeah, another one, Jenny Analytics. That's a per that's my personal favorite because, uh, uh, well, we at Amazon we act on data all the time. So we do not make any decisions without understanding what's the underlying numbers in that. And to understand that, we need to understand the data, and there's lots of data. So in, my, in many different com companies, it can be CRM data, it can be data from creek streams, it can be data in analytics stores, it can be data in transactional databases, and not everyone in your company knows SQL. Like, let's, let's be frank. It's like, okay, multi, most, most developers have to know SQL, but not, not most developers are A, anal analysts to begin with. And not all developers work, work with business and not all developers just want to touch it even. So <laughs> basically the idea here is that you provide an interface to, to the data and this interface, interface what it does, basically you, just, you can just create a web app or whatever, which just takes the re request, converts it, let's, let's say SQL or, or whatever, makes the request to open source, to transactional database, whatever, gets the response back, summarizes the whole thing and gets it back and, and provides it back. Where it might be useful, actually, um, I've heard a few requests from folks who are actually doing it, um, debugging, debugging of your product. So you have uh, lots of logs, for example, in open source, you have, uh, as I already said, so like metrics in your uh, Prometheus, whatever. Uh, so yeah, just understanding what's happening, what's happened during the incident, instead of just uh, getting there in the middle of the night, like opening your logs and trying to figure out what happened between 12:05 and 12:06 in the morning. So yeah, it's not the best thing. So basically, the de uh, debugging using the LLMs it's a very, very interesting use case, and it's already been done by uh, who would you think? BMW. Yay. <laughs> so these are pretty pretty big ones, and so they not only do that, they also do like interactive dashboards. So when when the request is coming, they they build the whole dashboard, and it's presented to business customers and uh, other other speci specialists or whatnot. Another use case is when they're your platform provider, and you have a users of your platform, and this users of your platform wants to know. Uh, how the user, how, how their users actually use their platform. So instead of creating the pipeline where the platform providers come to you, ask, okay, we need a report, and we need a report on this this type of parameters, and we need, and we need it yesterday, and we need it uh, like with this, 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 and you have a huge Jira ticket backlog, and you don't understand which is which is the priority, so you forget about the whole thing and get fired. So uh, basically, that's the idea. So you provide the interface to. Um, to the customer so they can tap the data and just ask it naturally, build build whatever dashboards they want, and that's that's the wrong problem from here on. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's just to reinforce the whole thing, basically speaking about the dashboards. And I, I know a lot of companies implement that already. We also implemented the whole thing. It's called Amazon Q. So basically when you just Type in, okay, I have this corpus of data. I need to understand how many sales, so how many players have played the game, how many tournaments been run, who, who killed whom in a, in a Counter-Strike tournament, whatever. Um, yeah, so basic idea is just give it give it to the business users and they will they will understand the whole thing. And well, it will not be done overnight. Obviously, you will need to understand how the whole thing works and how to embed it into your product or whatever. But yeah, it's it's a good thing. So summary, summary is pretty, pretty interesting here because let's get back. First of all, traditional machine learning and Gen AI, they are built for different use cases. So traditional machine learning built for specific use cases, you train for this specific use case. Well, that's basically it is. Gen AI are more generic, but currently, if you want to use OCR system, I would not recommend using Gen AI. I would recommend actually just a common machine learning model. Uh, and one additional important thing here is the security. Uh, and security aspect is, is very interesting because in Gen AI there are so many things that might go wrong right now. And especially if you use external services, uh, I, I won't name any of the services, you know them already, but the fact is that not only you feed your data to God knows where, and this data can later be used for training, 
It's like, okay, just, just to make a distinction, when you feed the data to the model directly, it's not being used for training. But this data is stored somewhere because y your history of conversation is stored. And this history can and most likely will be used for training, which means that not, not that only someone can see your data at some point of time, but you, uh, if you get the recommendation from, from the GenAI model, which you do not control, you can get someone else's data which might infringe some, you know, legal things, which is, well, you know, the same goes for the code generation tools and whatnot, whatnot. So very important piece here is that you need to control the perimeter of where you store the data, how you interact with, da with data, with the LLM models and whatnot, whatnot. So yeah, I will not dive deep into that. If you're interested, we can just uh, speak. <laughs> outside the session for the 10 minutes that I have before the, before my taxi catches in. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Please fill in the survey. <laughs> so. We have a few minutes for some questions, if you have some. Yeah, four minutes still. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting and very broad. Please help me understand one thing which I don't understand at the moment. Mm -hmm. When I saw uh, generative AI and ChatGPT and so uh, one year ago, uh, and then I saw my kids playing uh, video games and seeing NPCs in Fortnite and other video games, I thought, I told them, look, in one year it will be completely different because it will be run by AI agents and you will be able to communicate with them using the Gen AI uh, technology. And it will be a much more sophisticated NPC, which is at the moment. And this doesn't happen. And I don't understand why. Could you help me with that? Thank you. Well, that's an interesting one because, uh, well, I'm speaking about application of Gen AI in gaming and whatnot, but Technically, what I heard from some of the customers, like large customers, they try to avoid Gen AI, actually, by multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, well, obviously, uh, Gen AI hallucinates. Uh, it, it has to be controlled, governed, and, and not everyone understands how to do that properly. Because governance is the biggest thing. So, for example, what happens if you generate an image, a generated texture for your character, and it generates an image, I don't know, of Conor McGregor? with whom you do not have a contract with. So it's, it's, it's just, just, uh, just a very simple example. But another, uh, another reason here is that a lot of large companies, they do, not want, they do not want to suppress the creativity of their staff. So a lot of, custom, uh, a lot of folks, uh, they are using Gen AI and started to get lazy with it. Uh, it's more applicable to marketing departments because currently there is a there is a research run by multiple companies like uh, Statista or whatever uh, that says that already 79% of marketing department folks already use Gen AI and it will grow in like 20% within a year. Uh, and the, com the large companies in terms of game, uh, game creating content, they want to avoid their stuff getting too lazy and too generic and just rely on these tools. So it's, it's, it's a balance here. So a lot of, a lot of people, they do not understand that it's, a, it's just a tool that helps you. It, it's not a tool that does your job for you. So, yeah. Someone else? No? OK, no, thank you very much. Ah, no. uh, do you know how many uh, gaming companies are using uh, Gen AI for, uh, to replace their creativity team at, at the moment? To completely replace the creativity team? Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, if you uh, have any idea? Uh... No, not not really. So uh, right now, most use cases they revolve around knowledge bases, and they revolve around marketing. Like for example, well, user retention basically is the most common thing. So basically, when you need to generate some images or whatever for the customers, and very interesting example I just ha had recently, like a lottery uh, customer, they generate. They, they tried actually to generate uh, ticket design for the customers. And uh, spoiler alert, uh, customers prefer design which is as ugly as possible. <laughs> so, generate, uh, Gen AI generated this nice 
planetscape, nice picture, which is like super appealing, whatever. But customers look at, at the common lottery ticket, and this one it says, "No, I don't like this one. I don't like this Gen AI stuff. Just give me the com 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 just a common ticket that I got used to." So it, it, it's it's a balance here. So I haven't heard about use cases when being completely replaced, but there are use cases when uh, people use it to enhance their work, and there are a lot of them. So yeah, <laughs> I think I'm 11 seconds over time. 12, 13, 14. It's yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Van. Again. Yeah. Okay.